to extend a special welcome to you, and there is a gift waiting for you at the Welcome Center in the lobby that you can pick up. Also, uh, if you are new, we invite you to uh, scan that QR code in your bulletin, and um, you can click on the I'm New button and find out more about Bridge. Okay, also our women's retreat. I'm super excited to tell you that our 2024 women's retreat registration is now open. Hopefully you remembered to save the date, September 27 through 28, and it'll be from a Friday evening to Saturday evening over at Maranatha, right down the road. So um, this will be a time of Bible teaching, fellowship, worship, fun. Um, we'll be able to enjoy all that Maranatha's grounds have to offer. So again, in order to find out more information and to register, you can scan that same QR code and click on the Women's Retreat button. Uh, if you have questions about that, feel free to reach out to me after the service or Sarah here. Uh, we would love to give you more information, and we hope that you can make it. Okay, lastly, uh, we uh, coming up July 14th, which is a Sunday, is one of our favorite days here at Bridge of the Year, our family day. So uh, in place of this service here, both campuses will be meeting up at Dalton campus. We'll have a time of worship with Cedarville University's Heart Song, and then that will be followed by a picnic, lunch, and games and fun, and I hear even a bounce house for the kids. So uh, registration closes in a week for that. So you can register using that same QR code, uh, clicking on Family Day, and then you can put in your t-shirt sizes for a free t-shirt too, okay? So that's it for this morning. We're happy you're here, and you can stand and worship with us. It is good to have each one of you here today. Thanks for being at Bridge. We're here to worship our King. Think about all he's done for you today. Come let us worship our King. Come let us bow at his feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how his love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God. You have done great things. He's been faithful, and you've been faithful through every storm. You'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things, and we know, oh, and I know you. For your promise is yes and amen. You will do great things. Oh God, you do great things. Oh hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh God, you have done great things. We dance your freedom awake and alive oh jesus our savior your name lifted high oh god you have done great things oh hallelujah god above it all hallelujah god unshakable 
done great things. Oh, hallelujah, God, above it all, hallelujah, God, unshakable, hallelujah, you have done great things, you've done great things, oh, hero of heaven, conquered the grave you free every captive and break every chain oh god you have done great things we dance in your freedom awake and alive oh jesus our savior your name lifted high oh god you have done great things you have done great thank him today together. Yes, God, thank you. We have this confidence in Jesus. His blood has brought us into freedom. There is no other that can save us, cause we know, yes we know, it's Jesus. He is always with us, faithful and true, in our weakness, He is bringing us through. The highway through the valley, the promise through the pain, He is always every lie for every lie that speaks against us his blood declares we are forgiven there's only one who never fails us cause we know yes we know it's Jesus so cause we know yes we know it's Jesus he is always with us, faithful and true. In our weakness, He is bringing us through. A highway through the valley, promise through the pain. He is always with us, faithful and true. What can separate us from the love of Jesus? Nothing can. Oh, what could come against the love of Jesus? Who would dare stand in his way? There is no power that can hold back Jesus. He's here to save. He's here to save. What could come against the love of Jesus? Who would dare stand in His way? There is no power that can hold back Jesus. He's here to save. He's here to save. He's here to save. He's here to save. And He is always with us faithful and true in our weakness he is bringing us through a highway through the valley promise through the pain he is always with us faithful and true yes he is always with us faithful and true and in our weakness he us through the highway through the valley the promise through the 
pain He is always with us Faithful and true Yes, He is always with us Faithful and true Amen Oh, that's, that's good to sing, isn't it? Uh, we've known that, haven't we? We've known that He's a highway through the valley. We've known that He's a promise during the pain. We've experienced that in our lives. We've, uh, we've walked with Jesus. We've, we've experienced his presence and his comfort with us in the hardest times, haven't we? And he's never been unfaithful. He's never been unfaithful. In fact, he can't be unfaithful. It's not in his nature to be unfaithful. He's always ever faithful. I love that Paul, when he's writing to Timothy, he says, when he is, or, sorry, he says, <laughs> sorry, he says, when we are faithless, he is faithful. When we are faithless, and not if we are faithless, when we are faithless, because we will be faithless, right? There will be times that we don't follow Jesus Christ the way that we intend to. We are sometimes faithless, but even in those times, he remains faithful, cannot disown his own, cannot disown himself. And um, I came across this quote. I thought it was a pretty interesting one this week um, by Josh Howerton, who's a pastor down in Texas. He said, some say, I wish the church would go deeper. Most Christians are educated past their level of obedience. If you would just do what you already knew, your life would change. And, you know, I, I thought about that. It really convicted me in some ways, that, especially that line, that idea that, that uh, most Christians are educated past their level of obedience. And I thought about my own life, my own heart. Is that true of me? Am I educated past my level of obedience? And I think, yeah, in a lot of, in a lot of cases, I, I, I know the right thing to do. I know who God is. By his grace, he's revealed himself to us through his word. And, and we have no excuse for not growing in our understanding and in our knowledge of who he is because he's revealed himself to us. But then we also come to the point where we realize, okay, it's one thing to know all of that, but have I surrendered my life to it? And uh, unfortunately, if, you know, um, if, if I were to be honest, I would say, boy, there are times where I know the right thing to do, but my stubborn will doesn't want to do it. I want my own way. I know God's way is better, but I want my own way. And in those, in those moments, I'm educated past my level of obedience, and that's never good for me. And, and maybe you're relating to that yourself. And I would say this, this next song, it challenges us to surrender our stubborn will, to surrender our own way, which we think sometimes is better, but we really know, no, it's not. It's not. God's way is always the, the right way. And so let's make this song our prayer. It simply says, yes, I will lift you high in the darkest valleys. When the, hard, the, the hardest times come, uh, sometimes it's easy to rationalize that our way is better, but really those are the times when we need to surrender our lives to what God has for us. So let's sing this uh, with passion today as we make it our prayer. Yes, I will.
now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Oh, yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. And yes, I will bless your name. Oh, yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy from all my days. Yes, I will go for all my days. Yes, I will. And I choose to pray. Glorify the name of all names that nothing can stand against. Yes, I choose to praise to glorify, glorify the name of all names that nothing can stand. I choose, I choose to praise to glorify, glorify the name of all names. Nothing can stand against, yes, I choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names, that nothing can stand against, oh yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley, and yes, I will bless your name. joy when my heart is heavy from all my days. Yes, I will for all my days. Oh, yes, I will for all my days. Yes, I will. And I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me a sinner condemned unclean how marvelous how marvelous how wonderful and my song shall ever be how marvelous how wonderful is my Savior's love for me he took sorrows he made them his very own thank you Jesus he bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone we're singing how marvelous about that day when with the ransom in glory his face I at last shall see will be my joy 
joy through the ages to sing of his love for me. Oh, how marvelous, how wonderful am my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. His love for me, we're singing how marvelous, how wonderful and my song shall Today we are so thankful uh, to be able to come to a place like this, uh, a comfortable air-conditioned room, uh, uh, a room where we have the freedom to lift our voices and to declare what we know to be true, to come to love you more, more deeply uh, than, than hopefully we did even on the way in here today. God, I pray that as we focus on your word of truth through, um, through your friend John, as he... Uh, shares with us um, the details of your life and um, who you exactly are. God, I, I thank you that uh, we have that understanding and that we can allow it to come into our own thinking, come into our own hearts and change us from the inside out. God, I pray that we would allow you to do that in whatever way you desire today. We pray it all in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. You guys can have a seat. Well, good morning. Whoa, that's probably more than I need. Uh, my name's David, and it is my privilege to present to you today something out of God's Word. Um, Friday night, Pastor Eric and I had the great privilege of uh, joining uh, Mealtime for Fresh Coast, uh, Fresh Coast Alliance for a group of people who are in recovery. And we had a Q&A session after both of us shared our testimonies, and one of the ladies asked, tell me about your church. You say you preach the word unapologetically. What does that mean? Do you talk about these things, these things, these things? And my response was, we start wherever the Bible starts, and we go through verse by verse by verse. So if whatever that you just ask is in there, we're going to teach on it. So if you're visiting with us today, that's what we're about to do. We are in the book of John. If you'd like to turn there, we're going to be in chapter 10 today. And we're going to study this little portion that has been assigned to us. John, as good authors do, gives us his thesis statement right off the bat and tells us, well, he doesn't get it right off the bat, it's at the end, actually. But he does tell us, and he said he is writing so that you and I can believe that Jesus is the Christ. He had, at that moment, known people were going to be coming in to the church to persuade believers to turn to another direction, that Jesus would not be the Son of God. He also knew that we would have that, and he wants us to be able to defend ourselves in the faith. He wants us to not drift away from our faith. And then he says he wants us to believe this so that you and I have life, in his name, and we're going to really kind of see something about that today, which is really a, a great passage to look at. Um, so the question is, are you here today, and how do you answer that question? Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? You don't really have a middle ground here. There's no uh, B plan. It's either you believe in the Son of God and have life, 
or you don't believe in the Son of God and you have only this life. And that's what's laying before us and we have to kind of see what that looks like. We've decided to divide this up into eight different sections, each message being seven messages. So we've already looked at the commentary part and that's when others say Jesus is the Son of God. That's, that's what we looked at. <clears throat> For seven weeks, we looked at the miracles, and those were evidences that Jesus is the Son of God. Now we're about to do the I am statements. The I am statements are Jesus simply saying he is the Son of God. And so if you're here today and you're steeped in Christianity and you know the Old Testament, you understand probably the significance of the phrase, I am. Imagine if you're at work and someone says, could you just tell me a little about, about yourself? And you said, I am. What would they say? I am what? I am who? What do you mean? You are. You am. That's not good I, English. I get that. But just think about that. Well, you could probably think about it that way, that he's just saying, I am, which is, doesn't fill anything out. But we need to look at the Old Testament, and I know if you were here before you saw this, there's some significance about this. In the Old Testament, Moses was told to go to Egypt to uh, bring Israel out, and he would have to tell the people of Egypt, of Israel, and the, the Pharaoh of Egypt that God had sent him, and he said, basically, what shall I say to them? Who shall I say is coming? <laughs> Who shall I say sent me? Who is this? And that's where Jesus, or God simply says to Moses, I am. Just tell him, I am. What God is doing in that statement is he is claiming to be the self-existent one. He is claiming, I need nothing. I am all of myself, period. So God claims that. Well, when we get into the book of John, especially in chapter 8, where we, we're, we're going to be getting to, Jesus himself identifies himself as the existent one, self-existent one. And he says, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And so what he's doing is he's claiming to be the son of God. In fact, he does this repeatedly in front of the, the religious leaders of the day, which was just, to be honest, irritating to them. Constantly saying, I am, I am, I am, I am. For us, we don't get that as much, but if you have a, a Jewish uh, background, you would understand the significance of this phrase. Well, not only does he do it this way, he actually comes up and he gives us seven I am statements. He says, I am the bread of life. He says, I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the vine. I can't wait to get to that one in three, four weeks. I love that. That's my favorite of all of those. We're, we're drilling toward that end. So when we looked at the bread of life, we found out that Jesus was complete satisfaction for us. When, last week, Eric, uh, Pastor Eric talked about the light of the world. He's our illumination. <clears throat> Today, the door. <sighs> so I was gone last week. I was in Portland, Oregon. My grandson graduated from high school, so we went out to Portland. I'm working on this message on the door. I don't know what's significant to you about a door. How many of you actually look at your front door of your house? Anybody? I mean, you actually come home and you go, nice door. Anybody? Anybody do that? You just kind of walk in and walk out? Okay, I just need you to know, I got home and I got a letter from my HOA, the condo association, from the president. Cut the feed. David has been instructed to paint the trim. I don't paint. I don't paint. Paint the trim and the door of our house. I immediately went outside and looked at my door. I'm studying about a door, and God brought me face to face with a door. I think that's just funny. Not so funny after I got quotes to have the door painted. Anybody want to paint a door? I got a door for you. This, this is really cool because what we're going to find out in this story is that the door is access to what's on the other side. You're here today. You've either gone through the door and you're enjoying or wondering what's on the inside or you're standing on the outside. You're looking at the door going, should I actually go into this door? 
That's where we're at. And Jesus says, I am the door. And that's where we're about to go to. So the big idea, um, you'll see why he uses the phrase I am, because what he's actually saying, I am, is really short. My big idea is quite long. So here's the big idea. When Jesus uses this I am statement, he is stating that he is on the same level as the Father, as the self-existent one. And as the self-existent one, he is the sole and only source for life, and therefore the Son of God. That means he's it. He is not inclusive. He's exclusive. He's saying, this is the door. I am the door. Those who believe can come in. That's where he's going. So we have to ask this question. I was going to actually have you do this, but I didn't know if this would actually work today if I had you stand up and do this. Answer this question. In this world, <clears throat> what are you pursuing? I put on there, in this world, what are you pursuing? Anybody want to answer that question? You don't have to answer the question. It's just rhetorical, but you get my point. What door are you hoping will open up for you? What would be the best door? You couldn't wait until that door opens up of opportunity. Would that not be great? What's behind the door you want opened? What's there? That's kind of what we're going to see as we go through here. And Jesus uses this phrase, the door. So let's go ahead and read the text. For those of you in the back, sorry, this is the, there's two paragraphs, and I wanted to put them both in, in, in one slide, so forgive me for this, but here's one slide of the, we'll break this down and blow this up a little bit, you'll be able to see it, and then the, we'll go, but there's two paragraphs, and he starts both paragraphs with the phrase, truly, truly. So let's just read this, get it into our head, and then we'll probably, we'll break it down and see what he says. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter into the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up another way, that man is a thief and a robber. At this point in time, you would have to know a sheepfold. We'll get to that, but just let's go on with the text. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, very significant here, a gate, the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out when he has brought when he has brought out all of his own he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice a stranger they will not follow but they will flee from him for they do not know the voice of strangers very significant and this he, he adds this john adds this little commentary here just so us we can understand what's happening this figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was talking about. Rough translation. All right, second paragraph. Because since they didn't know, let's just start it all over. And he does. Jesus said again to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. And all who come before me are thieves, came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and to destroy. I came, everybody finish this with me, that they might have life and that they might have it more. Everybody in Awana say amen. Because this was the best Awana verse ever. Verse 10, okay? Uh, there's probably not a better chapter in the Bible than John chapter 10. I say that every time I preach on a chapter, but you get my point. This is such a great chapter. We're going to get into the shepherd next time. In fact, verse 11, which is right after this, says, I am the shepherd. So we're going to mix these two together, and you're going to see metaphors and pictures, and that's just gonna, how it's going to go. But let's dive into this and figure out what is he saying by this door concept, even as they shut the doors in the back because I'm apparently too loud for the kids in the other room, Okay. So here's the first verse of this passage, and it says this. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs up in another way, that man is a thief and a robber. Why on earth did he start with this in chapter 10? So we have to ask the question, this concept about a door, what does it mean? Why did he say it? I'm going to give you two reasons where I think this fits. One is you have to understand the society that they're living in. How many of you in here are sheep herders? I knew we had one, so I'm going to challenge you the whole time, Gus, to see if you're fulfilling this whole obligation here, okay? So I should have Gus come up and tell you about sheep, because he, you could tell us about sheep, could you not, brother? Okay, so anything I say that's wrong, you just correct me now, not later. Just 
Just raise your hand and say, David, no, 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 no. He's got it all wrong. Help me out because I'm probably going to mess this up. But here's the first thing you need to know about this. this they lived in a, 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 a culture where sheep herding was the thing. It was the main thing. It was like a very, very important part to them. So having sheep and a, a shepherd and all that fit. And so here's a picture. This is kind of a crude picture because the wall is probably supposed to be bigger than that. But that's, and the, the shepherd slept. We're going to get more into this. The shepherd slept in the gate to protect the sheep. And that's where you're going to get this, I am the door. So you see where we're going. The part that we're supposed to see from this, I think, is that the door gives you admission, the door gives you protection, and the door gives you provision because you can go in and out to get provision. If your door of your house only went one way and you could only go in and you can't come out, you better hope you have a, a good, what's the food people that deliver food? Yeah, DoorDash. You better hope you have good DoorDash because you can't, does that all make sense? Okay, so that's what we got here, uh, admission, protection, provision. So there's a little picture of what he's trying to do, but he's really going to drive this home. There's another reason he uses a door. And to understand that, we got to ask this question. Who is he talking to? He says, truly, truly, I say to you. Remember, the Bible was not necessarily written to us. It was written for us. We have to find out what the context here. In your Bible, no matter what version you have, there's a, there's a separation between chapter 9 and chapter 10, which is what makes 1, 9 and 1, 10. We all get that? There is no separation in the original writing of John. There is no separation here. He has already written 9, and now he's about to go on from 9. There's no movement by Jesus. He didn't go to another village and then started this. He's here in chapter 9. He, he healed the blind man. You everybody remember that story? Say yes. Okay, he, he healed the blind man, and he could now see. He has illumination. And does everybody know what the Pharisees and Sadducees, the religious leaders, did to him at that moment in time? Kicked him out of where? Okay. When Jesus heard that they had kicked him out of the temple. Okay, do you know what happens when you get kicked out of the temple? They close the door. Are you following? They closed the door on him. He literally couldn't go back in. And there's little literal gatekeepers at the door of the temple. We'll talk about that in a little bit. There's gatekeepers. And guess what their job was? To keep people out that weren't supposed to come in. The man was healed of his blindness by Jesus. But because Jesus did it on the temple and he then professed that Jesus was the son of God, they kicked him out and closed the door. Do you remember how supportive his parents were? The kid becomes, was blind from birth, and he, all of a sudden he can see, and his parents went around and threw a party and said, look at this, my son sees, this is so cool, I get it. he finally sees my face. No. The parents were so afraid of being kicked out of the temple and having the door closed on them that they refused to acknowledge Jesus healed him. You see what's happening here? The Pharisees, after they're hearing all this, they ask this silly question of Jesus, and, and we talked about this when we went through it. I won't break all this down. But they said, are we also blind? Are we also having a problem? Are we supposed to be shut out? And this is the backdrop for Jesus saying, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door. Does that make sense? Here you have a man who has lost. If you, if you were kicked out of your home and you were homeless, wouldn't it be great to have a door to walk back into for a home. Would that not be awesome? I was just out in Portland, Oregon. I don't know if you know anything about Portland, Oregon, but they have a lot of homeless. Any one of them would have taken any door to come in, to be in. This is how the, this man is religiously homeless, and yet he is spiritually sound because Jesus says, I am the door. Don't miss the picture here. This is so cool. So he says, truly, truly, remember every time Jesus does one of these truly, trulys, it's amen, amen, that's what he's saying, but when he says it, normally we say amen at the end, he's saying amen, amen, meaning I'm the authoritative person, I own this, I know this truth, I made this truth. This is very significant, he does this 25, 26 times in John, here's one of them, truly, truly, I say to you, so let's talk about the false door first exposed, this is what he's about to do, so let's just look at this real quick. Um, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, 
Okay, so he, he automatically says there's a false door out there. The people who do this don't go in by the right door. Okay, so we showed up at the bed and breakfast in Portland, Oregon. My wife has a, an instruction sheet. I don't read instructions. I think that's just a waste of time. I said, she does. <laughs> she says, honey, we're supposed to go to the back of the house, and there's a door with a key lock, and here's the code. So I come around the corner, I got suitcases and backpacks, and I come, and here's this beautiful, beautiful slide-out door. And then there's this little door. I'm like, that's got to be our place. So I'm looking at the door. I said, what is this supposed to There's supposed to be a key lock? I don't find a key lock. I don't want to tell you how long I did this because it's embarrassing. This door is a beautiful slider door. I'm looking at what ended up to be a storage unit door. I have no idea what I'm doing. Finally, thanks to my beautiful, lovely wife, she points me in the door. I think this is our place. And it was amazing. I'll, if you want to go out there, I'll give it to you. It's an Airbnb. It's really cool. Sorry, this was no promotion for them. It, but there was a false door, and I stuck at the false door. Here's the thing we need to understand. False teachers, false doors in life deny the true door. I kept, she kept saying, I think, no, that's not our door, honey. It's got to be this door. I was being a false teacher to my wife. I should be, sh never mind, we won't go there. Do you realize how much the world has invested presenting to you and I false doors to enter? Anybody ever, don't raise your hand, anybody ever enter one of those false doors? Think about that. Two, he says this, but they climb up another way. Not only do they deny the right door, but they create deceptive doors. And then finally he says this, that man is a thief and a robber. So not only do false doors present wrongly to us and don't provide what we want, they actually destroy us. Anybody know anybody who went through a door of life and their life was destroyed? That's what he's talking about. You'll love this word thief and robbers. The word thief is the Greek word klepto. You all know that word? Kleptomaniac, someone who steals. It was actually referred to Judas later in chapter 12. He was a thief. He stole money from the money bag for Christ. The word robber is used of, of Barabbas as a violent robbery. So one is just a petty thief. The other is a violent one. You and I in life have these doors that are presented to us, and we think they're so innocent, but in the in really one is a petty thief about to steal everything you have and the other is violently going to rip your life apart. You want to see that door? I can take you to places and see that door where people have walked through that door. I have knocked and gone through those doors. By the grace of God, that's not true anymore. <laughs> I just want you to think about this. This is, this is the setting that he's saying. By the way, he says, all those who went before me, we're going to get to in just a minute. Guess who he was talking about? the Pharisees and the religious leaders who had shut the door on this blind man. This is quite in-your-face preaching right here. Jesus is, I don't know his tone when he does this, but this is fire and brimstone quality stuff right here. So let's move on to the next part of the text. Oh, sorry, I forgot this part. Uh, we'll get into this more next week when we talk about the shepherd. But this whole concept of false teachers, in Ezekiel 34, we'll, we can read, we'll go back and do that next week probably when we do the shepherd part. He talks about, Ezekiel says, my people have been led astray by false shepherds, by false leaders, by false teachers. Be careful who we follow. Make that application in your life real quick. Who, are you, who, 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 are, who is your, who's your person that you're following? The nation of Israel was brought low by false teachers, by false leaders. That's what was happening to them, okay? In John 8, he brings it even closer to these Pharisees because he says, you are, you are liars like your father the devil. That's hellfire and brimstone teaching right there. And when he says you are like, false teachers are like saint because they tell lies, that takes us all the way back to Genesis 3, which is significant in this whole story. In Genesis 3, we have this very young lady. She's so sweet. She's like innocent. And some slimy snake of a guy comes along and tries to convince her 
to partake of a fruit of a tree, and he deceives her by lies, by deception, not by violence, just by twisting God's word just a little bit. And from that point on, Adam and Eve were sent out of the garden. Can I just tell you, false teaching is a part of Satan's work. It started in the beginning, and it continues today. And you and I have to have some defense against that, and that's where he's about to go with this text. So let's dive into it again and try some more things here. Just start digging this out. Let's talk about the real door as it's explained by Jesus. He starts with this. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the gatekeeper opens. The gatekeeper opens a door to the shepherd. So what is that all about? This is significant. Um, and we'll kind of unpack it a little bit, see if you can catch it. The interesting thing is that the gatekeeper, when, when in, in the town, uh, let's, we need some shepherds. So we got, we got Gus as a shepherd. Who else wants to be a shepherd in my little play here? You want to be a shepherd? What, I forget your name, young man. What? Noah. Noah. Oh, that's a great name for a shepherd. By the way, many of God's leaders were shepherds. And Don, you're going to be a shepherd today, Okay. So Don's a shepherd, and Gus is a shepherd, and Noah's a shepherd, and David is a shepherd. And at night, you would bring all of them to the same sheepfold and put them all in. And one of us has to spend, stay up all night and watch a sheep. No, that's you. Because we're all old. We can't stay up all night, okay? So Noah, you have to stay up all night and watch our sheep. Does that make sense? Okay, you got it? Okay, now Noah, this is a quiz. Don't mess this up for me because it's going to mess up the whole message. It's all on you, brother. Okay, make sure you get this guy on film. All right, so Noah, in the morning, in the morning, who can come in and get their sheep? That would be a good one, because you have sheep in there. Which sheep do you get? Say your own. Thank you. Who else can come in, Noah? Which ones? Who? Which ones? Who? Who? Thank you, that's an excellent answer. And who else? God, perfect. He's, not, he's calling them by your first name. He's, he's embarrassed to do that. And, Don, and, Don. and who else? Don. Don, this is amazing. Can Dan come in to get the sheep? No way we're letting Dan around sheep. No way, that's not going to happen. Do you see? The, the gatekeeper, this is very significant in this story. And this is very significant in the redemptive story of Scripture. The gatekeeper would allow the right shepherd to come in. And if Don came in and called his sheep, only his sheep would come. We'll get to that in a minute. If I went in, but if Jeremy came in, he couldn't get, you wouldn't let, would you let Jeremy in? Would you let your father in? No, don't say, "Mm." (laughs) you're messing up my whole illustration here. Okay, do you get the point? The gatekeeper in this case gives Jesus authority in this story. And the gatekeeper, we're going to find out, is God. God is the gatekeeper. And now watch how this unfolds. I love the story in Genesis 3. After Noah, I'm sorry, not you, Noah. After Adam and Eve are kicked out of the garden, do you know what God does? He puts in the pathway of garden angels with flaming swords and says, you cannot come back to the paradise of God. The whole redemptive story is for God to be remove that gate that's preventing us from going back to Eden to enjoy sweet, sweet fellowship with God. That's the whole story of the Bible. And when Jesus says, I am the door, you know what he's saying? I'm taking place of those angels. Uh, you don't know this, but in, Genesis, uh, in Chronicles, uh, it, um, Samuel and David are listing out all the people who should be in the temple, and they list out the gatekeepers. Take a guess how many gatekeepers there were. Somebody take a guess. Twelve is a great number. Two? Two hundred and twelve gatekeepers, and he named them. It's great reading for the morning. (laughs) Wonderful stuff. Do you know why? Why is the gatekeeper so important to the temple of God? Because the gatekeeper only lets in people who are supposed to be in the temple of God. Do you know who the gatekeeper is? The gatekeeper is Jesus. Uh, John 1, 33 and John 12, 
God says, I approve of Jesus. He is. He's my son. I approve. I give him authority. John 6, says, God doesn't, no one comes to Jesus unless God first calls them. Can I just tell you, this is just a wonderful passage, that God has set a gate up that no one gets in except the shepherd, and God has given Jesus, the Son of God, the authority to let you and I in through him. I could probably stop here, but I still have more time, so let's keep going, okay? Uh, let's get some more stuff out of this. Uh, the sheep hear his voice. Uh, let's start with that, okay? Jesus is a door because he has a personal relationship. This is tying into the shepherd part, but that's okay. Um, so the first thing we're going to see here is about this voice that the shepherd here. Now, Gus, it, it, everything I've read, that if I went to your house and I called your sheep, they would not come. That's true. So can you tell, how do you call your sheep? I was so hoof. I was so, ho ho go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> and you shake the red bucket, okay. They know the sound. Okay, all right. That's kind of how Robin calls me for dinner, too. <laughs> Except it's a blue bucket, I think. Uh, this is really cool. The, the word voice, they hear his voice is the, is the Greek word phone. It's phone. It's a phone. How many of you, when you get your, you, hit, you, you know, you, I know you can see it, it, but if you listen, you go, oh my gosh, it's my wife on the phone. How many of you got that? By the way, Robin and I now have a code speak that if one of you fake your voice to me, my wife, like AI, we have a code word. I'm not telling you what it is. Because <laughs> AI can fake my voice. Does that make sense? Okay, so I, I had to Google this. This time it was too intriguing to me because everything I read that the shepherd, doesn't matter what clothes you have, doesn't matter, they, they know the tone of your voice. God created them that way. So here we go. We're going to try to make this work. The wind in the background is really bad here, but this guy is calling his sheep. Shh, silent. Say peace. I have no idea what he's saying. I've listened to it a thousand times, but you can Google it on YouTube. It's a great little... See Gus, you got you to up your game from a red bucket to whatever he was doing there. But <laughs> I don't know, whatever he was saying, the sheep came, and it goes on for quite a while. More sheep come. He, they, he can't see them, but they're out there. That's what he's trying to talk to us, that the sheep hear his voice. Is that not great? How many of you kids know the voice of your mother? How many of you know the voice of your mother when she's not happy? <laughs> Every one of them shake their head. I'm so shocked that our mothers are sometimes not happy here. How many of you husbands know the voices of your wives when they're not happy? <laughs> you see, the voice is so cool. We're going to dive into this so much. I don't have time to develop it now, but we'll do it with the shepherd part. We'll go right back into this same thing. You might see the same video again next week. I don't know. Maybe I'll go out and videotape you with a red bucket instead. I just want you to see how beautiful that is. The shepherd, Jesus is the door, and he knows who he can let in and who he doesn't let in, and we know his voice because we hear him. Let me just go on and then we'll put some application in. He calls them by name. Uh, okay, how many of you have animals, pets? Somebody give me the name of a pet. Preferably something other than a dog who will eat me alive. What's the name of your dog? Lady. lady. So if, if I were to go to your house and call Lady, would Lady come? Now, Lady would come and beat, bite me no matter what, because uh, dogs want to bite me for some reason. So what's your name of your dog, Noah? Sherlock. I love that. How big is this dog? Oh, uh, never mind. I don't like this. We, yes, go ahead, go ahead. We, I can't turn this off now. Yes. What? Blue as opposed, opposed to red? Oh, like gold? Oh. 
I love your dog. Do you know, this is so awesome, do you know that God of the universe, through his son, knows your name? I got clients that don't know my name. Actually, I don't know their name. He knows your name. I love uh, Revelation, I, I'm not going to get this correct, great, 2, 14, 2, 17, uh, to one of the churches, he who conquers will be given, when you get to heaven, will be given a white stone, and on that stone will be a name written for him, for you, and only you and the Father know that name. That's how we get that song, there's a new name written down in glory, and it's my, I cannot wait to get to heaven, get my white stone with my name, who God calls me. I love that. Last part of this. Oh, oh, no, go back, David. Think of the blind man here. Do you know the name of the blind man? No, because John doesn't tell us the name of the blind man. But God knows, and Jesus healed him and knows his name, and we do not. I think that's an amazing. Think of the crippled man that, God, that Jesus saw around the pool, and he said, you want to be, Jesus knew his name. Think of the little boy who brought the lunch. We don't know his name. Jesus knows his name. You are not insignificant, folks. God knows your name, and you should go and rejoice about that. And he leads them, and they follow. This, he leads so that it implies that we are followers. I'm going to dive more into this when we actually get to the shepherd next week, but this is really great. Notice what they will not do because they know the voice. Sheep will not follow the wrong shepherd. Because they know the voice. This is how you and I studying God's word and knowing when a false door is presented to us, we don't go open to that door because we know what the true door looks like. That's what we're doing to the kids right now. The kids right now are learning something so great. They're learning what the true door looks like. And while you're praying in here and praying for this, you need to be praying for them because they are being presented a choice of a door and we're praying that they choose the right door so they don't have the mistakes David did and you had in their life. It's a wonderful thing that's happening here right now. The true door expa explains some more. This figure of speech he used, um, they did not understand it, um, which is true for the Pharisees. Uh, here's the thing I would just add. When you continually choose the wrong door, you will never be able to understand the right door. We are in chapter 9. They have rejected Jesus countless times, and we're only in chapter 9. When we, or chapter 10, when we get to 11, 12, and then on, they will so reject him that they will crucify him. You continue to reject him, something will go wrong in your life. That's what we get from this passage. John 16, 25, 29, he says, I will, someday I will no longer speak in figures of speech. In fact, verse 29, the disciples go, okay, now I'm understanding, which is a really cool, we'll get to that passage. I love James. He says, if we ask for wisdom, he'll give it to all men liberally and won't withhold as long as we approach in faith. God wants to tell us things. He wants us to hear him. So Jesus says it again. How many times have you heard the gospel and rejected it? He's saying, I'll tell you one more time right now. Truly, truly. I can confirm this, that I am the door. This is, uh, in the Greek, very, very explicit that he is not saying a door. He is saying he is the door. You don't get a choice of other doors. There's, I'm going to show you a quote, hopefully here in the next couple of weeks, from a very, very powerful writer who, I just came across a quote, I'm, I'm still studying it to make sure I want to show you how bad it is because it's not the door. There's many doors. And I'm like, I can't believe he actually wrote this. But I want you to think about this, how when we get to he is the truth, the way, the life, he is not offering other options for us. Before me, thieves and robbers came. These were all the false prophets who came before Jesus. He said they all came, but the sheep don't hear them. And so here's the thing that I think we can take from this. Entering the one and only true door protects us from danger of any and all wrong doors. The more you and I walk in obedience, look up 2 Corinthians 10, 6, the more you and I walk in obedience, the more we will crush disobedience in our life and prevent it from, from offering itself to us. Obedient walks, following Jesus, is a way to prevent 
temptation to do wrong. Uh, I, love, where, I don't know where you're at, Mark, but I love the, the thing you put up there today with the statement, um, help me out, I missed miss the statement now, that the guy said, we are, we are overly educated and under obedience. Is that, that's, I think I'm getting it. Yeah, we are, we are very much, no too much, as compared to what we're obedient. The more we're obedient, the more the knowledge we have takes, flight, takes place and we are not led into temptation. It's an amazing thing. I am the door. Let me just give this to you. Uh, we're going to get some of this again with the shepherd, but entering the right door does a number of things. One thing it does. Is that not great? This is the whole point. <laughs> Don't miss the whole point. He who enters in the door by me, not by anybody else, will be saved. Will be saved. Uh, we, we sang a song, and I think it came up in big block letters. <laughs> he will save. He will save. Do you realize that's what this is all about? We have little kids right now hearing the gospel. Maybe for the first time we should be praying right this moment that they will hear Jesus Christ and receive him and have salvation from their sins. That's what the gospel is all about. If you're here today and you have never received Jesus Christ in payment for your sins, you are not saved and you have a destiny you do not want. He came here to save. I love this next part. You can go in and out. I think what this means, okay, and, and again, Gus, correct me if I'm wrong, but when the sheep come in, they're inspected, they're, they're taken care of, they're nourished, they're cleaned, then they go back out into the pasture land, and what happens to them? They get dirty, they get yucky, they get pestilence, then they come back in, and the shepherd inspects each one of them as they come in and make sure they're clean and taken care of. That's sanctification, my friends. When, you, when we come to God, we come in, and then we go out into the world, and we get filthy, and we come back into his fellowship. And, of course, we never leave that. Don't get too hooked on that analogy. But that's what he's talking about, that we go in and out, in and out, in and out, and the, the shepherd is taking care of us. It's a wonderful picture for us. Lastly, the thieves only come to steal and to destroy. We've already read that. You and I because we go through the right door, have separation from deception, from deceivers. And again, walking in obedience is the sure way to prevent deception from taking over your life because you're walking in obedience. One last one, that they might have life. Entering in the right door provides us with life. What does that mean to you? Life. How many of you have life? How many of you have a life? Anybody have a life here? I had my heart attack 15 years ago. The doctor walked in. He said, you have no reason to have a heart attack. Well, what, what do you do for a living? And I told him, he goes, dude, you need to get a life. I wanted to quote to him John 10, 10. I have a life. I was so absorbed in everything of the world. It was crushing my heart, literally crushing me. And I was making such poor choices. And he, that's why he said that. Can I just say to you, he's about to unpack for us something very good here. We're going to get it into more next week. When we don't, don't not come next week. We're going to talk about the shepherd, and he's going to expand what this means. Because he doesn't just say life. He says abundant life. Men, if you're going to buy your wife an anniversary present or a, or a birthday present, do it abundantly. Don't do it on a lamb. Don't do it off of Amazon. I hope it gets here the day before or the day of. Do it abundantly. If, if she asks you, do you love me, don't just say, I love you. Say, I love you abundantly. Huh? Try it. Go ahead. Turn to her right now. Say, I love you. This is not a joke. I love you abundantly. Okay. Some of you are not participating. <laughs> I have, I'm not going to read into that. Can I just say to you how much amazing this word is? This is superfluous. This is above and beyond. Whatever this world presents of life, this is not what he's talking about. He is not talking about something psychological. He's not talking about something occupational. He's not talking about something I can do all the psychological, occupational, uh, social. He's not talking about financial. He's not talking about any of that. He is way past all that. The Pharisees are sitting there going, I got a life. The people sitting around, I got a life. That's not what he's talking about. He's going to unpack this next week when we talk about him as a shepherd. 
He is saying to us, he has come to give us abundant life. Theological life of a relationship with Jesus Christ in the midst of anything you're facing in life. Give me the name of one believer who suffered. Quick. Paul. Stephen. What? All the disciples. John is writing this as he's going to be exiled to Patmos, an island for thieves. And he says, he came to give life abundantly. I don't know how you describe it, but this is, this is more than what you think. This is the beauty of who God is and what God provides us. You know Psalm 23, correct? The end of Psalm 23 says, surely goodness and mercy will hunt you like a dog. That's the Hebrew translation. That's what it means. As I follow the Lord, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me by blah, 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 blah. Surely goodness and mercy, goodness and mercy, not riches and occupation, will follow me. It's the word, hunt you like a dog to the end of your days. How many of you would love to have goodness and mercy hunt you down? How many of you would like him to overtake you? <laughs> that would be the more thing. That's what he's saying. And this is not 1622. There's not that many verses in 16. It's 1611. You make known to me the path of life in your presence is fullness of joy and at your right hand, your right hand, Jesus Christ is at God's right hand, are what? What's the word? Pleasures forevermore. You make known to me the path of life in your presence is fullness of joy and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. That's abundant life right there. And if this doesn't help you, go back to Second Peter, our study. He says, by his divine power, he's presented to us all things that pertain to life in godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own excellence by which he has granted to us his precious and great promises that through these you and I might become partakers watch here he goes partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world because of lust that's what he's trying to tell us that's abundant life what are you looking for what's behind your door let me just close it really quick when Jesus uses I am statements, he is simply saying, I am the self-existent one. I am the source for abundant life. I am the bread of life. And by the way, we didn't talk about this much. He says, you will never be hungry. And then when he said light, he says, you will never stumble. And now when he says well, he's the door, you and I will have behind the door abundant life. You get the point what he's trying to say here? I am the bread of life. I am the light. I am the door. Next week, I am the shepherd. What should you take from this as the band comes? First of all, the truth I want you to get is very simple. He is the door that provides abundant life. Believe that. Two, action that we need you to do. When you see the door, rely on, don't rely on outward appearances of the door. Because the world's doors look pretty cool. But you open them up and the first room looks really nice. And the deeper you get into the house the more dingy and dark and destructive it becomes. And you can't find the door to get out. Kneel and ask God to give you discernment about which doors you're facing. I love Hebrews 12, that we would have discernment to know what is good, acceptable, and perfect. I pray that over my grandkids' future husbands, because most of them are all girls. I want those grandsons to be, I want my grandbabies to marry people who have discernment, who know what is good, acceptable, and perfect because my grandkids are perfect. Pray that over your kids, that they will know what is good, acceptable, and perfect today. It's a powerful, powerful verse. Last one, engage with your neighborhood. Engage with people, and when they are in darkness, tell them about the light of Jesus that's abundant. Stand with me if you would, please. Father, we give you this time, we give you this message, we ask that you just bless us, help us to be obedient, and follow you as we hear your voice. Thank you that your son was the door that offered, offered access for us to come to you. In your son's name, amen. Amen. Well, this uh, final song we want to end with uh, really relays the experience of those who have entered by the way of the door, uh, Jesus. And so uh, these are very familiar words to a lot of us, but don't let that lose, lose the meaning for you. Uh, think about uh, what it is that we're expressing as we sing together. darkness. 
darkness we were waiting without hope without light until from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. come and to reconcile the lost to redeem the whole creation you did not despise the cross for even in your suffering you saw to the other side knowing this was our salvation Jesus for our sake you died Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of All of heaven held its breath Till the stone was moved for good For the Lamb had conquered death Amen! And the dead rose from their tombs And the angels stood in awe For the souls of all who'd come To the Father on Come on, church! And the church of Christ was born And in the Spirit the flame. Now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel, shall not fade. By his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, free in love, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings, praise forever. Hey, there we are. <clears throat> well, if you are visiting or new, my name is Jake. I'm the student ministries pastor here. And we have something we want to do with you this morning. So I want our team to come on up. Um, if you are new, maybe you haven't heard, maybe you haven't seen around lately, but we have a group headed off in like, well, if we're on schedule, like 14 minutes. Yeah, that's not going to happen. Um, we are leaving, and this is the team that is headed to Italy. 
And so uh, Keith and Debbie Jones, uh, they are our ministry partners. They are church planners in Italy, and we get the benefit um, to be able to be the hands and feet. Um, one of our, our parents this morning said, hey, you guys are from Michigan, and you're going to Italy. Michigan looks like a mitten, and Italy looks like a boot. You are the hands and feet of Jesus. Ah, got a good dad joke in. <clears throat> Thank you, Kelly. Um, but in all of that, um, I wanted to take a quick minute to update you. Maybe you haven't heard recently what we're doing. Maybe you haven't heard anything that we're doing. Um, and I am just very, very impressed in what God has done up into this point in our team. Um, watching them, they have been working hard for a very long time. Whether it was making boxes in order to raise money, planter boxes, or getting covered in flour, making empanadas, whatever it was, these kids have worked hard putting on fundraisers that many of you guys have been blessed um, to be there for through pancakes and tacos and things of that nature. But they're going to keep working hard. Um, we're not just going to go over to Italy to have fun, although we will have a lot of fun. It's already started. Um, <clears throat> But they're going to work hard because we are going to help. Some of you guys remember two years ago for our end of year giving project, um, one of our end of year portions uh, was to help Veritas Church procure a permanent building. Well, we get to go work on that building. And so to watch God connect those dots for us has been really cool. But if you see pictures of the outside of, of their building, it's covered in graffiti. And we get to wash all of that off. We also get to uh, basically de-junk their backyard, tear out tons of gravel so that they can get ready to actually plant grass and have a yard uh, for their church to use. So that's going to be very warm in 85 plus 90 degree weather in humid. It's going to be awesome. Um, but we also have the benefit because, hey, transportation of this team requires large vehicles that I'm praying the seats come out of because then we get to help move their buildings because they don't have vehicles large enough to actually move furniture and equipment and things of that nature. So watching God even put his hand in that has been really cool. And another thing that they get to um, participate in is a whole lot of painting. Um, so they are going to have some fun. We have painters on our, our trip that are professional, um, and so it's going to be a whole lot of fun. But watching God show up has been a joy up until this point because he has shown up in our team. He has shown up in connecting some of those dots. Another cool thing that God has shown up in, it's small in comparison, but has been one of those fingerprints. As we were talking a couple weeks ago, I figured out, as I talked with Keith, that the house, the building we are living in, is literally right across the street from the church. So we don't have to worry about tons of driving. We don't have to worry about like figuring out traffic patterns and when do we have to leave in order to get... We just walk outside our door and walk across to the street. And so that was just a fun little fingerprint from God. We get to work with a ministry. Um, this was a, a cool connection. Keith came to me and said, hey, I... I this isn't with our church. This isn't anything to do with us, really. But there's a ministry across town that needs help. Would you guys be willing to help them? Uh, yeah. Um, and so even to help them foster those connections. So we're going to be uh, able to do a small VBS in English in order to communicate the love of Christ in a different way than what we are thought we would be able to do. And so it's just been very cool to see God show up and minister um, behind each and every one of these people. There's 20, 30 people um, that are praying and supporting. And so watching God show up in that has been, um, it is the blessing of the administration um, is watching those things happen. And it's also a blessing, um, and we are thanking God that we are at 106% um, of, our, of our support. Um, which is just awesome to watch God show up. But it's fun for me to then turn to our team and say, hey guys, God isn't random. He is, we learned a few weeks ago, he is the God of abundance. But he, that abundance doesn't just come freely. 
we get the privilege of passing that abundance on. And so we have $2,659.72 that we didn't plan we needed. But apparently, down to that 72 th cents, I think God has a plan for all of that. And so it's exciting to help our team say, hey, as you're working, as we're ministering, as we're walking down the street, and the Holy Spirit taps you on the shoulder and says, I would love to, guess what? They get to follow those promptings of the Spirit. And that is a cool thing to watch us see God's abundance and turn around and hand that abundance to other people. And so it has been awesome to watch God up until this point, and I cannot wait to watch him as we walk out these doors in a couple minutes, get in the white 15-passenger van, and drive three hours to O'Hare Airport. Our journey starts, um, and to us, it's unknown, but we serve a God that knows every single step, every single moment, every single aspect that has already been ordained by him. And I can't think of a better, better thing to do than to follow him in all of it. And so I want to do something with you guys. I said, this is a church thing. And so team, why don't you guys go down in the middle aisle here? I don't know if you've ever been a part of a commissioning service, but we talk about the idea that we are sent out a lot in church. Well, I want for all of us to see what that looks like. So I want you guys to stand up. I want you to get comfortable with each other, put your hands out, grab a shoulder. I want us to see what does it look like for the body of Christ to gather together. Because sure, there are 16 people leaving this building, but there's not just 16 people leaving this building. Because that's the God we serve. That is the ability that we have being the body of Christ. Even if we are a quarter of a world away, um, we serve a God who is always right next to us. So we have some uh, of our outreach team and our elders uh, here uh, this morning that are going to pray for us. So if you are a part of that, if you're going to be praying with this mic, why don't you guys come up here? Um, sorry, I'll divert you out of the, the circle for a second. Um, but this is just a beautiful thing that we get to be the body of Christ. We get to come together um, at the feet of our Father um, and celebrate what he is going to do before we ever can imagine what he's going to do. So thank you guys for praying for us. Colossians 6 and 7. As therefore you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so live in him, rooted, built up in him established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Lord, we send these, these young adults off to you now, and we ask that their lives would be changed immensely from this experience. That those that receive from them in Italy would also be changed. We ask for your life to be extended through them. And Lord, we pray for the leaders as well as the young adults that they may empty themselves of self, that they may be filled with the Holy Spirit, that they will realize that they are going through the power of the Holy Spirit, that they're not just using their own natural gifts and talents, but that they will call upon you to enable them to love well, those that they are serving, the church, the neighborhood, the ministries that they have, that they will use their hands by the power of your Holy Spirit and be hard workers. They will use their feet by the power of the Holy Spirit to be willing to do whatever task that they are called to do, that they will be willing to be humble in spirit and bold in declaring your word, that there will be peace by your Holy Spirit among the group and among the youth group that they are interacting with so that nothing, nothing will interfere with the work that you are calling them to do. We thank you for their willingness. We thank you for their obedience. Put a hedge of protection over them. Give them safety, health. Give them joy in this journey. And may they go 
in the power of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we thank you for clearing a way for this trip and thank you for all the planning and all the details. Thank you for uh, Keith and Debbie and their hospitality, their partnership, dear God. Thank you for their new building. Thank you that they're almost debt free already. And uh, but more than that, dear God, I thank you for these teens. I thank you that you've given them a desire to follow you. You've given them soft and moldable hearts, dear God. I thank you for the the leadership that's been a privilege for me to observe as they lead in our space on Sunday nights and uh, the example they've been uh, on other missions trips in Detroit and involved in their churches and local ministry around here, dear God. So we pray. We pray for them. We pray for all the details of the trip. We pray for safety and traveling and for nerves. But dear God, we pray that you would just continue to mold their character. We pray that they would delight in you and delight in serving you, dear God. And I pray that when times get tough and they're frustrated um, and they're weary, I just pray that uh, they will just demonstrate uh, your joy and peace and patience and kindness. And that would be what people remember when they leave, that they saw you through the fruit of the spirit of our teens, dear God. I pray that they would be active listeners. I pray that they would uh, just show your love through uh, focusing on, on the details and the task, but even more than that, dear God, just uh, genuinely being interested in the work that's being done there and being learners, dear God. Help them to be great learners of what's going on in Europe. We thank you for the good work that, you know, we think of Europe as a dark place, dear God, and, but uh, there's light there. And help our teens to be encouraged by the light that's in Europe through Keith and Debbie and your work there, dear God. So bless them, bless them as they go. And may your name be honored among the nations, we pray. Amen. And Father, we just, it's us from Bridge again. <laughs> it's, it, we have people going and coming, wanting to serve you. And here we are with another team. And it isn't insignificant that you chose this team to go on this trip. And as already has been prayed, Put a hedge around them. Protect them. But yet, let them hear your voice. Let them sense your direction. Let them step forward in faith like they're doing right now. We have folks right now out on the field doing things for you. Too many to recount right now, Father, but protect them. There's a trip right now going to Chicago. We pray that you would protect them as they go. Give them the strength. Give them the ability to be in your word, to hear your voice, to walk in your way. Thank you for this opportunity. May it be one that will honor and glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, guys. You guys are loved. Keep us in your prayers. And we will see you in a couple weeks.